My guest today is Travis Shepard. Travis, how are you? Hey, I'm doing all right. Uh, it's, it's a pretty nice day here in Nashville, Tennessee. It's a pretty nice day here in Chicago, Illinois as well. Cool. Uh, what, tell me, what do you do for a living, Travis? Well, I'm, I'm a software consultant. Uh, I, I work for a company actually out of Chicago. And, you know, that's, that's where we met doing another yeah. video together. Um, so, yeah, I work for Canon Carta. Um, they're a good they're company. Top, yeah. Great company, great um, mission for people, planet, and profit. Um, I've been doing consulting for them uh, for about two years now. But I, I'm a longtime uh, Microsoft developer, classic Dear. ASP, you know, the early days of .NET, um, you know, on through .NET Core and Azure and all that stuff. But uh, recently I've been doing a lot of Java, so we could have a whole other video on .NET <laughs> versus Java. Uh, that would be amazing. I never have those debates. They're both good. I, yes, I, I they, they are. <laughs> they are, but it's different learning process. Yeah. Yeah, but I came today to talk to you not about the software development part of your your life. I want to talk about something you're doing uh, outside of work. Uh, yeah. You've got a new hobby, or not not a new one, but you have an interesting hobby. Yes, uh, something I've always wanted to do. Um, something that is completely different than software development, um, and that is flying airplanes. Very cool. And uh, you're, uh, you were telling me off camera that you're close to getting your license, correct? Yep. Yeah, I started at the beginning of this year, finally. Um, I was going to do it 10 years ago, and it just wasn't the right time. So I waited a decade, and then I finally started in January of this year. So, yeah, I'm taking my private pilot check ride next week. And then will you be a licensed pilot? And then, yeah, as a point of uh, uh, clarity, it's, it's called a certificate. So okay. you, I will have my private pilot certificate. So um, that is the first thing that any aspiring pilot has to go through to get before you could get anywhere else. You need the private. Okay. So does that, uh, what does that buy you? That now, now you'll be able to fly by yourself. Mm -hmm. Is that what that does? Okay. Yep. Uh, what you cannot do now. The law says you must have the certificate That's right. in order to fly an airplane with yep. no one else in the cockpit. Yeah, there, there are a few other licenses, like a sport pilot and a few other, like a recreational, but this is the the major one, the major first step. So I can fly by myself, I can fly at night, and I can take passengers. Cool. So that, Well, good luck like next week, and congratulations. <laughs> yeah, let's we'll see how it goes. I'll check in and see if I actually pass. You know, not everybody passes, and it's a lot of work, so... This show is called Technology and Friends. So let's talk a little about the technology of flying. What, what, what are the core principles you need to understand to do this, to me, very counterintuitive thing? You know, yes. If I had never seen an airplane before and I saw it for the first time, it would blow my mind. Yeah, it, it, flying has been amazing and recent thing in, in the course of history. It was yeah. 1903, right? So 120 years ago um, mm -hmm. when the first person flew. Um, and, you know, even back to Da Vinci, right? The, a great inventor and technologist. I thought about it. You know, the, lots of people have tried, very smart people have tried, but we, what, what we didn't understand was the basic um, principle of lift. And you, you would have to, there's two main um, principles there. One goes back to uh, Bernoulli, right? And he built like that Bernoulli's, or it's called a venturi so it's like an hourglass it has a throat in it that that uh constricts air so when you move air through that venturi and it forces it to compress right it speeds up so to get the same volume of air through a smaller part the air has to travel faster okay that makes sense right so now the wing of an airplane is one side of that venturi so you turn that hourglass on its side and and you take that little hump right that's the top of a wing of an airplane hmm. so when the wing of an airplane's passing through air 
the air on top goes over that hump and it moves faster than the air below it. Okay. Now you have a low pressure on the top, high pressure on the bottom. So the high pressure pushing up on the low pressure means there's more force pressing up than there is pressing down. That's lift. That's lift. Right there you have it. Yep. And it, it sounds so simple. Yeah. It, it took a thousand years to figure it yep. out. It sounds very simple. Yeah. Yeah. And it and if you get enough speed and you know, it doesn't matter how much the the thing weighs. It doesn't matter even aerodynamics of the shape, sure matter, but with enough speed you can make anything go up. Interesting. Yeah. Um, tell me a little about the experience of flying. Is it similar to driving a car or is it a, very, what are very, very little, very little. Oh. Yeah, it, it is. It is totally new. The only thing else I can think of that it might equate to would be a submarine. Right. Okay. I've never been on a submarine. Neither so have I. I. This analogy. Yep. <laughs> I've been on a boat, but still on a boat, you're in 2D space. You're on a surface and you're going forward or sideways or something. Um, but in the air, yeah, 3D space is completely different. So, yeah, you can, you can roll the plane side to side. You know, you can pitch it up and down or you can yaw it, you know, this way. So there's six directions you can uh, push this plane or you know let it fall that's always a direction too um, <laughs> that's not a good decision the, the other major difference is um just the the mechanics of operating that kind of vehicle is is the number of inputs you know if, if we think about a car um you know we have a gas pedal a steering wheel a brake maybe a clutch yeah. and a shifter we're looking yeah, at controls that right. uh, internal controls that determine how the car. Yeah. Moving. So the pilot of a car has six to eight things, you know, your speedometer, maybe your gas gauge, if you want to keep an eye on that. Um, and of course the big thing is the window. You're looking out the window. Back to the external. Things. Yes. Um, Make sure no other, the other cars are a safe distance away and not yep. doing anything and, unexpected. Yep. And making sure you're going where you're trying to go. Um, so in a plane, it's about 30, right? Oh. So the number of things you, your mind has to keep track of, um, you know, to be, what are some of the things that, uh, you need to keep track of in a plane? So, yeah, as I mentioned, the, the, the yoke and the rudders that controls those three axes of the plane. Okay. Right. Um, so yeah, you have this and then your feet actually control the rudder. So a lot of people don't know this, but when you're on the ground in a plane, you steer with your feet. Okay. So you're not, you're, you don't even need, it's hands-free. You're, you're pushing on the pedals and that makes you go this way. It's the same in the air that controls the rudder in the back, like a boat, right? Uh, that makes you yaw left or right. Um, so both your hands are busy, both feet are busy, right? And now we're talking about your throttle, the the mixture of air and gas. Okay. Right. And uh, what what does that control if I change that percentage? Uh, so both the throttle and the the mixture control the carburetor of the engine. So, of course, to make an explosion, right, in a combustible engine, you need uh, a, a fuel like gasoline, kerosene, diesel, something like that. Um, and you need air, right? So if, you, if you, mm -hmm. this is all, even your car works like this. If you mix those yep. two things and put a spark in it, it's going to blow up. Right. Right. So yeah, okay. you're controlling the amount of air and fuel mixture, right? As well as just the pure amount of air fuel mixture that's going to the pistons that's going to that explosion chamber in the car. Yeah. Right. So in, in what is it, what does it do in the air? There's, there's no pistons in the plane. Oh, there is pistons. Yeah. It's, it's, Wait, there yeah, are. Oh. it's a combustible and just like your car. Oh, I see. It's controls the propellers then. Yes. So the, the pistons are attached to the rotor of the propeller as opposed ah, to see. the axles of the wheel. Yeah. Got it. 
Yep. Uh, tell me, uh, now there's, there's gotta be some software involved here. And so putting on your software development ad, what's, yeah. how does that work? Well, yeah, a, a lot of the planes I've flown actually have very little software in the plane because okay. they're very old, right? Uh -huh. Um, like the planes I fly, you know, you, you, you would probably walk up to them and say, I don't know that I want to get in that plane. <laughs> it's like a sop with camel. That right. Snoopy flies. It's an old, right. an old dog house. <laughs> yep. Uh, so you know, it's a it's a glider with a lawnmower engine. <laughs> what could go wrong? What could go wrong? Um, but you know, uh, just a side note. Uh, but planes have a whole different level of maintenance that go on. Whole different level. So you don't have to maintain your car legally, but a plane, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, actually, in Illinois, you do have to maintain. It <laughs> the, There's an inspection every five years. Every five, yeah, yes, I guess, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's similar. Not down here in Tennessee. Um, so, uh, what what was the question again? I forgot. Oh, just tell me about some of the software involved. You okay. said it's not in the plane, but I, yeah. it, it exists somewhere, right? It it is somewhere. Yeah. Uh, to me, the more interesting part is the non-software of okay. how, how your altimeter works and how um, your your attitude indicator works because it's all mechanical at least it used to be did you say your attitude indicator or your altitude indicator uh, there's actually both attitude and oh. altitude <laughs> that's measuring your attitude right if you're a little grumpy it'll turn red it's right. like a mood ring <laughs> yeah that, that is actually another import, important point of flying it is uh, just your mental state it's okay yeah there, there's so many. How, how could you not be in a positive mental state right. when you're experiencing the miracle of flight? Yes, it, it is thrilling. <laughs> it's it's a bit scary. It's a weird mix yeah. of of courage and calm. Like you mm. you have to be confident. You have to have some level uh, of courage, uh, but you have to stay calm. Right. I see. Yeah, and yeah, you have to let your brain process all these things and and know how these these old instruments work you know it's it's airflow and it's mechanical suctions and it's amazing how it all comes together but of course nowadays right all of that all of those round dial you know things are being replaced with a screen and mm, okay. in the plane they call that the glass cockpit because you're, okay. you're looking at screens a piece of glass mm. um well, how, how does the, the, the altimeter know what, how, how high you are? Yeah. How does it measure that? Um, air pressure, right? Okay. It's a, it's a barometer. So your altimeter mm -hmm. is a, is a barometer. Now it's not a barometer. Like it doesn't have liquid in it, right? So there's no mercury, right? That's a column of air that like goes to space is pressing down on, you know, mercury and making it rise up a smaller tube. So um, it, it, but it works on the same principle of air pressure. So it, it measures the difference between um, how high you are, right, um, and what the expected air pressure should be at that altitude. So, Interesting. Yeah. It, uh, so much of, of flying is about the, the pressure and density of the air that you're moving through. Okay. And you said the word attitude. We were joking about it, but what does attitude mean in this context? Yeah. So yeah, attitude is your, your plane. Like how are you? Tilts yes. up. Oh yeah. Back and forth and up and yeah. down. And your, it used to be called the, it is, and it's a better term. It used to be called the artificial horizon. Okay. Right. So you, you would know it, you know, it's a line with a little tiny plane in it. Got and it. When you tip your wings, it goes up, but the, the ball stays the same. Mm. And then so it's measuring how you are uh, relative to a plane parallel to the earth. Yes. Yep. Attitude. I, I just learned a new yes. word. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, it, yeah, it makes sense, right? It's like, yeah, if you got a bad attitude, you're you're kind of off <laughs> the, <laughs> the normal plane, right? I'm off kilter. <laughs> yep. I need to adjust my attitude. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So yeah, back to the software. Uh, um, I mean, it's amazing things that that Garmin has done. Uh -huh. um, and uh, the, they're kind of the, the top of the line, you know. You, That's interesting. Garmin yeah. used to kind of own the uh, GPS yeah. industry, but that's it's all built inside into the cars or into phones now. That yes, they're they're 
yep. been kind of pushed out of that market. But yeah, Garmin makes these yeah amazing devices that that still read these air pressure settings and whatnot, but translate those all into ones and zeros and display them in, in very complicated and busy UIs in, in front of your face when you're flying. Uh, interesting. So a lot of flying is being able to understand this complex user interface, process it really quickly and react to it. Yes. Yep. And also knowing that a lot of the user interface is delayed. Um, oh. Yeah. So your vertical speed, how fast up or how fast down you're going is delayed six or eight seconds. Oh. Um, so, and, and that's just how the physics works. It's not the software. Um, mm. So yeah. Um, yeah. Taking all these things, attitude, altitude, vid vertical speed indicator, obviously your airspeed indicator, um, your turn coordinator, um, of course your fuel gauges, your engine temp temperatures, your oil temperatures, oil pressures, all these things, the, the amount of electricity coming from the battery, going, going into the battery, all these things you're paying attention to, not to mention talking on the radio the whole time. Um, oh, what's that communication like? You're talking to a tower somewhere or another plane or what? Um, yeah, you rarely talk to another plane uh, unless, you know, there is no tower involved or you're just having fun or, or whatever. But yeah, um, aviation being the most heavily regulated industry, there is a network of, of air traffic controllers. Um, some are, are employed, built by the FAA. Some are privately. Federal Aviation Administration. Right. So now, it, of course, it depends whether you have to talk to them or not. Um, but yeah, when you're on the ground, you, you're talking to somebody before you can move. When Before you get on the runway, you're talking to somebody. Um, as soon as you take off, you're usually talking to somebody again. When you're leaving the airport's airspace, you talk to them again. And then they hand you off to another section. If you left Chicago, you would be talking to sh Chicago departure and they're going to route you, you know, ways to stay away from other airplanes. When you fly across the country, you're talking to larger sections, air traffic controllers control huge sections of land or, oh. you know, of airspace really, but over a grid of land. Um, so yeah, you're talking to a lot of people. So every, uh, every part of the U.S. is somehow assigned yep. to a particular air traffic controller center. So Absolutely. Take a tower. Absolutely. There's no, is there any, are there any gaps there that? Be below certain altitudes. Okay. Right? Because the, the radio communications don't work below certain altitudes due to yeah. obstructions. Mountains, hills, you know. So typically airspace below 1,200 feet. Okay. You know, is called uncontrolled class G airspace. And yeah, so there, it, that's really the only uncontrolled. Sometimes that goes a little higher. Um, but yeah, as, as we mentioned before, like it's illegal to fly in the air. Um, unlike if you, if you owned a thousand acres of land and you built your own airplane, right? Mm -hmm. And you're flying over your land, it's still illegal. Oh, I don't own the sky above my land. You don't own the sky. No. <laughs> so no. The only way I can fly, I must take off and land from an actual airport with a control tower and a licensed air traffic controller. Is that correct? Um, uh, not not uh, completely. Um, you know, <laughs> it, one interesting part is in in the regulations, right? Which is a very thick book of all the regu that controls how you fly how the airspace is controlled, all the procedures. One of the rules is in an emergency, you can ignore every rule in the book. Oh, if you need to land right away, then you need to find land. an open field and don't hit anybody. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, of course. Yeah. yeah. Imagine the paperwork after that, of course. But um, so um, there are most airports in the United States don't have towers. I see. Yeah. There, there are, thousands of general aviation airports with no tower. Um, and at that point, yes, you are just talking to the open airwaves, letting other pilots know what you're doing. 
hmm. and you can land whenever you want there. Oh, okay. I do remember talking to uh, a friend. I've lost touch with him, but years ago, he got his pilot license, and he used to fly up to, he had a house in Traverse City, Michigan, yeah. with one of these little tiny airstrips with no tower. Yep. And he said he, if he landed, he would always have to circle twice, mm. uh, once to scare away the cows right. who would wander onto the runway, yes. and then second time to actually land. Yes, that is a great idea, especially if you're going to a place the first time. Yeah, my, my instructor, I think, hit a coyote on on the runway at night. Oh, my goodness. So, he did uh, he drop an anvil on him? Right. That's how most coyotes die. Anyway. Right, right. <laughs> According to the cartoons, anyways. Right. But... Hey, I know uh, I know weather is really important yeah. in flying. Talk about that. Oh a my little. gosh, yeah, it's it's a huge topic, and yeah, um, it, it's it's really another place that the software it becomes like life or death critical. Um, okay. But just yeah, understanding the weather, and and I'm what they after you get your private, you're what's called a VFR pilot, which means visual flight rules. So you okay. fly by your eyes. So you can't fly in the clouds. If you can't see where you're going, you can't go there. Oh, so you're, you're not allowed to fly on a cloudy day or a right. foggy day, I should say. Yes. Um, if it's high so, cloud cover, you could probably fly below the clouds you, or above the yes. clouds. Or... The, and, okay. of course, there are certain rules. <laughs> you have to be 500 feet below the clouds, 1,000 feet above the clouds, 2,000 feet, right? And, and it depends on the airspace and, and all that. But... Um, so yeah, as a private pilot, you're limited to visual. It has to be clear. You know, I mean, you could technically thread the needle here and get around clouds. That's not a great idea. Um, but that that's the basic controlling factor of whether I can fly or not is can I see? Oh, okay. Fog, mist, rain, clouds, yeah. Are there times when it's illegal to take off? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, ultimately it's up to the airport operator. Um, but yeah, if, if it's fog on a runway, yeah, you're not taking off. It, I see. Um, yeah, and the airport that I fly at is actually kind of in the elbow of a river that goes around it. So often what happens in the morning on, on, in the summer is the fog rolls in, you know, because the moist air from the river rolls over the runway um, so we often, we had a lot of early morning flights. We'd often have to sit around and wait for the, the sun to bake the fog off the runway and then, and we can mm. go. Are right, any plans to buy an airplane to sell all those guitars okay. and invest in an airplane? Yeah. Yeah. There are lots of great jokes about this, about, you know, if you put aviation in front of everything, if, if you have a $10 screwdriver, if you call it an aviation screwdriver, it's now a hundred dollar screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> right i mean it's expensive it's, it's an expensive it, hobby it's it's an expensive hobby yeah um yeah it was, so the plane i was flying is in, was a 1969 cessna 172 1969 oh. yeah that's, uh, let's do the math here that's about uh, 54 years is that right right 64 years very old oh, 50, 54 <laughs> very old plane and you know it was still above a hundred thousand dollars uh for a plane. And of course, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to own a plane that old, you know, I want something cooler with the glass cockpit and more bells and whistles and at least okay. air conditioning. Right. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I'm immediately, you know, two, $300,000. And I mean, you, you, you take out a mortgage like a house basically. Uh, yeah. It, um, but typically what most normal people who aren't, you know, billionaires and, you know, doing all that is you rent a plane, right? Um, you have fractional ownership in a plane. Um, or you do buy a plane, but then you rent it back to like an aviation school or oh, okay. a plane rental company. Help, help pay for the mortgage. Right, right. To give me an idea of the cost of, of renting and of what, what you've gone through, the, the, the all the lessons and the certifications. Yeah. Um, so, in, and it can depend wildly. It took me longer because, you know, I have a real job and this yeah. is just a hobby. So it's taken about 11 months. Uh -huh. um, so 
you know, my training, you know, if you don't do it, you kind of forget. Um, and the weather was bad for a good two months. Um, so you had gaps and you had to definitely had gaps which... and it ran around $20,000. Okay. Um, you could do it in probably at, at about $12,000. If you were really good and the weather was great and that's all you did, 40 hour minimums. Um, yeah, you could do it under 15,000 and in, in probably a couple months. Um, mm. Uh, what, um, there's a lot of people watching this who like me have never even started this journey. What's, where would you go if you just wanted to yeah. get started? Um, best thing, yeah, just call up your local flight school and okay. take one of those free flights. That's what I did 10 years ago is I wanted to do it 10 years ago and I called him up and I took that introductory flight. I was like, this is amazing. This is, um, you know, I want to do this, but you know job family kids life gets in the way life all that um you know uh so i waited um, but that's absolutely what you should do and and yeah the funny story about that is i you know i thought i would show up at this introductory flight with you know they would sit you in the classroom and they would talk about what's going on you know and then you go up and fly for a half hour or whatever but but my wife dropped me off at the flight school and it was 90 seconds later we were taxiing on the runway oh my goodness that's great it was it, it was oh, exciting yeah he had already uh, pre-flighted the plane we just did a, the basic walk around he said get in he put me in the pilot seat not the co-pilot seat and said okay hands here feet here you know and we started taking off in nashville not the smaller airport but actual nashville airport Oh, it, uh, it was a BNA, I think. A BNA, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I've been there many times. You'll find out real quick if it's for you or not. You know. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. That's the whether you can overcome the fear. I think is what you're yes. talking about. The nerves, the yeah, and and even in my stress. real training, it was it was a lot different. I, I wasn't as comfortable as I hoped I would be the first <laughs> week or so because a small plane, yeah, it's it's a whole lot different. And flying a 737 or something well travis we're just about at time so oh. i just this has been one of the most enjoyable interviews i've yeah. done I've, I've, I've not only learned a lot but it's been a lot of fun Thank yeah you. well you know pilots they have a hard time not talking about piloting so i guess i'm going to be one of those all right and uh hey good luck next week hey thank you i really appreciate it david <laughs> Whether it's I'm flying or writing code or writing a bike or what, um, technology is just everywhere. And I'm, I'm always amazed at what people can do, what we can build. Um, we can fly, we can push electrons across the world, um, you know, and yeah, it's great to have friends like you, David, and friends like other pilots I've met and longtime friends in the in the software industry um, to enjoy the, all these experiences together.